Behind me is the lobby to a luxury rental here on Roosevelt Island called the Octagon. Its elegance now is a far desperate cry from what it once housed and where medical mistreatment and chronic mismanagement were reported in the 19th century. In the early to mid 19th century, New York City found itself in need of more space for criminals and the sick. So the city bought the 150-acre Blackwell's Island from the Blackwell family. The goal was to move the excess ill and indigent population from one island, Manhattan, to another. It would be the most desirable place to put the prisoners, the lunatics, the ill, the uh, indigent, and all the social uh, people with social problems of the day. A mental asylum, a workhouse, two prisons, and hospitals were built on the island by the mid-1850s, but almost immediately, problems arose. But they were always overcrowded. Every single institution here was built for one group and ended up taking in three times as many people. Author Stacy Horn combed through archival research for her book, Damnation Island. It's a harrowing account of life at the island's New York City Mental Health Hospital, also known as the Lunatic Asylum. There, according to Horn, the poor, the sick, and the criminal were all lumped together by the city's administrators. So the mentally ill were, uh, should be feared, um, and the poor people were essentially thieves in disguise and not worthy of our compassion, and that they all were guilty of something, some, something or other, and should be all together and away from the rest of us. What was worse, she says, was that the prisoners from the workhouse were used as nurses and attendants in the asylum. So that went just about as well as you can imagine. And I just found countless cases of abuse, cases of actual murder, though maybe you could call it manslaughter, but people died at the hands of these nurses and attendants. As Horn dug deeper into her meticulous research, she found other chilling examples of the horrid conditions at the asylum. So they put a pregnant woman in a straitjacket in solitary, and she subsequently gave birth while in a straitjacket in solitary. That actually at least was that word of that got out and it led to an 1880 a big you know, investigation. Charles Dickens, visiting in 1842, described the asylum this way. Everything had a lounging, listless, madhouse air. The moping idiot cowering down with his long disheveled hair, the gibbering maniac with his hideous laugh and pointed finger, the vacant eye, the fierce, wild face. They were all there in naked ugliness and horror. In 1887, journalist Nellie Bly faked insanity and was committed to the asylum. Her expose was serialized in the New York World, Joseph Pulitzer's groundbreaking newspaper, and became a sensation. She's always credited for, oh, it led to all these reforms. So I looked into that, and what I found was, just like everything else, no huge reforms. There were similar horrific stories at the island's smallpox hospital, where an estimated 13,000 people died of the disease over the 20-year period when smallpox raged in New York City. The hospital is now a landmark ruin. But the smallpox hospital had the same social problems of all the institutions. It was overcrowded, understaffed. They didn't have professional staff. They did have some doctors and some people who really tried. But in general, it was, you know, pretty sad. In 1895, the state took over managing all the facilities. They closed some of the buildings and they moved the hospitals to Queens. But Blackwell's Island over that 50 year period remains a dark stain on New York's history. But I'm sure at least half of them probably did not need to be there, but there was nowhere else to put them. And there was no social services per se. So you just put them in a convenient place and forgot about them. For Diverse City, I'm Craig Thompson.